achieved. Welcome back to Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions. As always, I am your host, Scott Johnson, and on this episode of the show, we're taking a look at the upcoming UFC on Fuel TV 6 event featuring Rich Franklin versus Kung Lee in the main event. That'll take place on November 10th, 2012 from Macau, China. And keep in mind, folks, this is an early start time uh, as opposed to the normal start time. In my neck of the woods, the prelims kick off at 7. I believe the main card is starting at 9 o'clock, so do not be late and do not wake up and miss it. Or if you do and can't get up that early, check it out on Saturday morning. Make sure you don't hit the internet until you've got a chance to go and view the fights after, after they've gone down. Now, I will be posting a bet pack for this event. There are, as I said, six main card fights, which we'll be doing predictions for in this episode. Only four preliminaries, which I'll be breaking down on the website. Bet pack covering everything, 10 bucks. And I am coming off a couple of, you know, subpar mediocre events where I went 6 and 6 and 5 and 5. There are 500 events in both from, uh, UFC 153 and uh, World Series of Fighting that last weekend. The worst I've done in a long time, so that's, you know, pretty decent. World Series of Fighting, I did go 4-0 in the main event. I did call Marlon Moraes to, uh, to upset Miguel Torres. Check that out as well. So uh, that was definitely a good pick on my part. Had a little bit of a rough uh, set of stretch in the preliminary fights, but either way, I'm hoping to rebound here. I think I should be able to get things going. We've got UFC 154 on the horizon after this event, so please check that out. As the bet packs will be available over at KamikazeOverdrive.net, along with all of my preliminary predictions. And before I get into my... Uh, First prediction, I'd like to thank all my sponsors, MMABettingOdds.com, HeartAndGlory.com, CouchFighter.co, MMACrypt.com, the guys over the Adrenaline, Adrenaline Training Center. Thank you very much to all of those uh, websites. All of the other sites that host and post my videos, or at least allow me to host and post my videos, like ShareDog.com, like Bloody Elbow, MMA Core, lots of websites allowing me to host and post. So thank you very much. And without further ado, we got six main card fights, so let's get into the first one right now. Our first prediction of the evening is coming in the UFC's lightweight division and will feature the only Chinese competitor on the entire card as Tia Trin Zhang, 18-3-0, battles John Tuck, 6-0. Looking at what Tuck has done, he's making his pr promotional debut, but he did compete and lose to Ally Quinta in the... Uh, preliminary por portion or the qualifying round of the Ultimate Fighter. Uh, he is undefeated, as I said, and his biggest win coming over Edward Fall along an eight second knockout uh, back in 2009, November 21st, 2009. Tia Trinh Zhang, on the other hand, returning to lightweight. He is coming off a UFC 144 knockout against Issei Tamura, where he got absolutely blasted. Prior to that, he dropped the decision to Darren Elkins. He does hold one UFC win over Jason Reinhardt with a suspension guillotine at UFC 127. Interesting matchup here. Tia Trinh Zhang certainly will have the crowd behind him, and he will have a significant significant experience advantage with 18 fights at Tuck 6. Uh, Zhang primarily has won the majority of his fights by submission, 12 in total. He has three wins by knockout. His law never got the decision to pick up a win. His losses one by knockout, two by decision. Tuck, on the other hand, six fights, six finishes, three knockouts, three submissions. His uh, win over Edward Fall along, impressive knockout, absolutely blasted him and stopped him. The guy's also a very talented uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioner. He's a brown belt. He competed at the World Professional Jiu-Jitsu Cup, winning the gold medal in the Open Light in, the Abu, in Abu Dhabi and a silver medal in the same year in the 78-kilogram uh, division. So very interesting. We'll see how Tia Trin Zhang fares in this fight. But uh, I've noticed a couple things. He's certainly, I think he's going to be a little bit gun-shy coming off of that loss to Tamura with a knockout. And he showed in the Darren Elkins fight, he's not overly comfortable when he's on his back having to defend submissions. That's something he's going to, I think you'll have to deal with in this fight. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this matchup. Should be interesting. I would like to see Tia Trin Zhang get a win simply because he is in his home country and the UFC is trying to promote uh, mixed martial arts in China. But I just don't see it happening here. So my prediction is John Tuck to defeat Tia Trin Zhang by knockout. Our next prediction comes in the UFC Bantamweight division is Alex Bruce Leroy Casera 7-5-0 welcomes, and I don't know if I'm going to say this correctly, but Motu Nobu Tezuka 19-4-4, and Tezuka taking this fight on short notice as Casera's original opponent dropping out, so it'll be very interesting to see how this plays out, considering Tezuka's only had about, I think, 10 days, a week and a half to prepare, and Caceres, likewise, a week and a half to prepare for his new opponent. Looking at Caceres, he's coming off a very impressive submission victory over a veteran fighter in Demacio Page. He could very easily be 3-0 since dropping to Bantamweight, but he had that loss to Edwin Figueroa based on a multiple groin shots and him losing a couple of points in that fight. Uh, Tezuka, on the other hand, impressive. He's got a lot of experience. He's riding a three-fight winning streak. The majority of his wins have come by decision with 13. He also has five wins by submission on the losses, I think. He's been tapped out three times for four of his losses. Alex Caceres has been tapped out four times for five of his losses. So very interesting. One thing with Alex Caceres, the guys have been improving constantly. He always comes out. He always shows more. He's, he should have a striking edge in this battle, I would expect. He's got some very long limbs, very, uh, you know, 
lots of kicks, lots of, you know, the striking's very interesting, and it's, you know, it's, it's, Kazura's a tough guy to figure out as far as I'm concerned because he is still developing his game. Tezuka, I, from the footage I've seen, I fully expect him to come out and look for takedowns. He's very, he's an aggressive grappler. His striking isn't bad, but it's certainly not something he's going to, you know, rely upon slight, uh, entirely for, to win this fight. He's got some decent submissions, will attack legs, but he's a very aggressive grappler when he wants to get the fight to the ground, and then he can, he'll just locks guys up, ties them up, and is very patient then at that point, looking for openings and controlling them. I think that attributes to why he has so many wins by decision at third. And I just said, you know, if, you know, Caceres' takedown defense is something I certainly have a few question marks about, or questions about, as far as this fight is concerned. If you look at his past track record against Damasio Page, he was taken out a couple times, spent most of that fight on his back looking for a triangle. And the question I got to look at there is, is if he doesn't get that triangle and the fight goes the distance, he spends the entire bout on his back. Can he win a decision? That's a tough one to look at. You know, against Cole Escobedo, he got taken down twice. Against Jimmy Hedis, he got taken down five times. He's faced some very good grapplers. It'll be very interesting to see how this goes to the ground, and what if Caceres can't lock up a submission off his back. If he gets on top, or if he's able to maintain the fight standing and use the striking, I think he wins this fight. But as far as I'm concerned right now, I see Tezuka maybe flying under the radar. He's a very talented prospect. He has, I think, the capabilities of winning this matchup with his grappling, and if he doesn't struggle from a conditioning drop-off, and considering that he's fighting, basically he's from Japan, he's fighting in China, so it's very close to where his home base is, I think he has an edge. So I'm actually going to go with Matumbu Tezuka to upset Alex Kazaris in a bit of a shocker and pick up this victory by decision. Our third prediction of the evening takes place in the UFC's lightweight division as two pride alumni, uh, to call the Fireball Kid, Takanori Gomi, 33-8-0 with one no contest, battles Ultimate Fighter winner, 22-9-1, Mac Danzig. Mac coming off a decision in victory over Efrain Escudero at UFC 145. Well, Takanori got back in the win column with a knockout victory at UFC 144 over AG Mitsuoka. Interesting matchup here to take a look at these two guys. They match up physically very nicely, both similar height. Uh, same reach advantage, obviously in the same weight class. So not a lot of physical advantages in either guy. Uh, the biggest thing that stands out to me is, you know, Gomi's only two years older than Mac Danzig, but I'd say he's got a lot more uh, mileage on those legs, having fought 43 fights compared to Danzig's 41. Still comparable in that sense, but either way, Gomi's been through a lot more battles. And I think Danzig, one thing with him, he's still developing his fight game. Gomi, on the other hand, very set in his ways as to what, we're, what you can expect from him. Gomi, his big number... Of his 34 career wins, 14 wins by knockout, 6 losses by submission, 6 wins by submission, I should say, actually both in both 6 and 6. Mac Danzing, on the other hand, he has knocked out 5 guys, including Joe Stevenson at UFC 124, which is fairly impressive. But his big total, 10 wins by way of submission, which is, you know, fairly impressive. He has been tapped out twice. The guy holds a submission victory over Mark Bocek, which is no easy feat, mind you. Now, the big thing with Takanori Gomi is he's a very awkward fighter. He throws that low stance... And he jabs with his left. He has power in both hands, but he has a tendency to jab with his left and then just rip that right hand like he's throwing a fastball looking to knock somebody guys out. And Tyson Griffin found it the hard way that if Takanori Gomi is able to land, he's going to put you to sleep. The big thing is, can he land? And he has issues with technical strikers. We saw against Kenny Florian. Florian used a jab beautifully to keep Gomi on the outside and really frustrate him. Nate Diaz used his reach and technical striking straight punches to really light him up and hurt him several times before submitting him. I think if Diaz stayed on the feet, he would have eventually stopped Gomi in that matchup. And even uh, in his last bout, Takanori Gomi's having some trouble. Mitsuoka had Gomi hurt in the first round and nearly submitted him. And that was a, that's a big issue, I think, in this fight, is the fact that, you know, Gomi's never been knocked out. He has an iron chin. But against, you know, Florian, against Diaz, and against Mitsuoka, he had trouble. He showed signs that chin could be cracking. That's something to be, con uh, you know, concerned with. He will attack the body. He does a nice job of mixing up his strikes. But again, that leaves openings. As, you know, he threw a shot to the body against Mitsuoka, and he got dropped by a counter and put him on his back. And, you know, take nothing away from Eiji Mitsuoka, he's not the most technical striker in the world. Mac Danzig, on the other hand, has very good boxing. Nice, straight, crisp punches, limited amount of wind-up, so it's very easy for him to, you know, stick him in there against a guy who's going to throw with big strikes. And I fully expect to see, you know, Gomi winding up and throwing big shots, and Danzig avoiding and encountering with quick, little, short inside punches. Another way Danzig should have an advantage. I know Gomi's got some good wrestling, but I really like Danzig's grappling game. He's shown what he can do. And if he gets on the cage as well and, and works the clinch, he can work guys over some short inside punches. And, you know, I know that Gomi's never been knocked out, and I was very much uh, considering taking Mac Danzig to win this fight by knockout. But I see a similar scenario happening. What happened in the A.G. Michioka in the first round of that fight. Same thing with... Uh, 
the Nate Diaz matchup, or even Clay Guida. Eventually, at some point, a mistake's going to be made by Takanori going whether it be a knockdown or a slip-up, and he's going to put himself in a position where he's going to defend a submission that's going to be very tough. Dan's a, very good on the ground. He showed in the Ultimate Fighter. He's he showed in his career so far. He has capabilities of submitting people, and if he can submit Mark Bocek, Bar- Bocek I think he can submit Takanori Gomi. I think he'll outwork him and uh, eventually get this fight into a... A, a solid position for him to set up a submission and go for the victory. So my prediction is Mac Danzig to, to beat Takanori Gomi by submission. Our next matchup is in the UFC welterweight division as the stun gun, Dung Young Kim, 15-2-1 with one no contest. Battles 14-4 no Paulo Tiago. Dung Young Kim coming off that TKO injury defeat against Damian Maya. Uh, prior to that, he had defeated Sean Pearson, and one fight even before that, he was stopped for his first career loss when Carlos Condit shut him down at UFC 132. Paulo Tiago, on the other hand, has lost three of his last four. He's coming off a brutal knockout. He does have a win over David Mitchell, which got him back in the win column. Uh, which snapped a uh, two-fight losing streak where he dropped fights to Diego Sanchez and Martin Campman. Now, looking how these guys stack up, Dung Young Kim, six wins by knockout, eight wins by decision. So he's had, you know, we haven't seen his knockout abilities in his UFC career yet, but he has shown himself very durable and, ability to, uh, and has the ability to go the distance and win fights. Paul Tiago, on the other hand, two wins by knockout, and he has a big upset with knockout over... Uh, Josh Koscheck. He also has eight wins by submission. He had that Darce choke against Mike Swick, which is one of his favorite submissions. You'll see him attempt that quite frequently. He tried that against Diego Sanchez late in their fight. And Paul Tiago, a very dangerous guy. His striking is a little bit, you know, still needs some tuning up. He's a little bit wild and loose with his striking, but he's a BJJ black belt in the show, and he's very capable of, of uh, beating guys on the ground. He's also a black uh, black Dan in judo, which is their grading system. But in this fight, Dong Young Kim is going to have the advantage as far as judo is concerned. He's a fourth Dan Black Belt in Judo, so that's very impressive, highly ranked, and we've seen the guy show how good his grappling is over his career, averages 3.46 takedowns per fight, 50% takedown accuracy, which is good, but it's the 81% takedown defense, which should be a big issue in this fight, because Paulo Tiago struggles in fights where he is unable to get the bat boat to the ground in a dominant position. In his last win against Mitchell... He was able to tie him and put Mitchell on his back several times, set up his grappling, and basically weren't won a decision on the basis of his ability to score takedowns and maintain top position. Against Dong Young Kim, I cannot see Paul Tiago scoring takedowns in this fight. I think Kim's grappling is going to be just too good for Tiago to take down. It's considering Kim is going to have an inch and a half of reach and two inches of height, it should give him some leverage and the ability to fend off anything Paul Tiago throws at him. And I won't be surprised if Dong Young Kim puts him on his back and beats him up and controls him because we've seen Kim not afraid to go to the ground with guys. Like, we saw him immediately go for a takedown against Carlos Condit, which ultimately cost him. But the same thing against Nate Diaz. He put him on his back and tied him up, did a nice job in that fight. And that's a big thing. If... if uh, Tiago cannot dictate the pace with his grappling. He's going to be in for a long matchup. Now, Kim's striking is still developing, but he's really showing against Sean Pearson. He can win a fight on the basis of his striking. He's got some nice straight punches. We saw him attempt the crane kick several times. He's really mixing things up, and I would expect, I would give his uh, striking an edge over Paul Tiago's because Tiago, you know, we saw against Kostchuk, he has power, but he throws those wild looping shots that if an opponent comes right down the middle, there's openings there for him to be countered upon. And, uh, I think that's what Kim will do. I expect Dong Young will attempt some takedowns, and they'll basically be points, especially in a close round. I expect him to maybe look to take Tiago down and control him and be heavy on top, lay heavy on top, and stack him up and drop some shots. But don't do it in a sense that, oh, it's early in the round and, and something bad could happen. Do it in that final minute, 30 seconds of, of, the, of each round to score points and maybe give that message to the judges that this round was, in fact, mine. Now, one thing with Kim, we've seen him have some conditioning issues. He, he looked much better against Sean Pearson going the distance in that fight. But he does have some conditioning issues in the later stages. I fully expect him to have the fight wrapped up in the first two rounds if he were to fade in round three. And Paul Tiago isn't exactly a workhorse either against Diego Sanchez. He severely gassed in the third. He didn't severely gas, but he tired in the third round, let's say, uh, when Diego was able to push the pace against him. And I think Paul Tiago will tire again here with Kim on top of him for and beating him up for the duration. Either way, Paul's a tough guy to put away, even though he did get knocked in his last fight. He might be a little tentative on the feet. I'll be surprised. Interesting to see if he shoots right away. But either way, I think Dong Young Kim has the more well-rounded game. So my prediction is Dong Young Kim to defeat Paul Tiago by decision. Our co-main event prediction of the evening takes place in the light heavyweight division, and whether this fight goes full the distance or goes one round or one minute, it's going to be an exciting matchup as Tiago Silva, 14-3-0 with one no contest, battles Stanislav Stucky Nedkov, 12-0-0, taking a look at what they've done in their last few outings. 
Uh, Tiago Silva returned to action and lost to Alexander Gossesson. He's kind of fallen on some hard times of late with one win in his last five. He did have that win over Brandon Vera returning to a no contest when he tested positive, and he actually sat out a, over a year as a result of, uh, or not quite a year as a result of that punishment. Uh, he's lost to some of the elite guys in the division. Knocked out by Leto Machida. Decision loss against Rashad Evans and, of course, Alexander Gustafson. He had a knockout win over Keith Jardine and, of course, the no contest with Brandon Vera in that time as well. Stanislav Nedkov, on the other hand, made his UFC debut at 134 with a first-round TKO victory over Luis Cain. But that was back in August 27, 2011. So the guy's been out of action for well over a year, and that's something to take in consideration. It's been due to some injury, other issues with getting fighting visas. So it'll be interesting to see how these guys match up, or at least how Nedkoff uh, comes in with ring rust as far as that is concerned. Now, in his total, Nedkoff has some serious power. Six of his 12 wins have come by knockout, four wins by submission, other two by decision. Tiago Silva, and the other guy's a killer. 14 wins, 11 by knockout, two by submission. And the guy is a BJJ black belt. So even though he only has two wins by submission, and he can work the ground, and we all saw in that Brandon Vera fight, he can dominate an opponent on the ground. Now that he's off the juice, well, interesting to see how his power translate. Because Stanislav Nedkov is a very t uh, physically strong individual. Now, how they match up, Tiago Silva's going to have three, and depending on what source you use, maybe four inches of reach, and uh, another two inches of height on uh, Stanislav Nedkov, which should help him out in that sense, both in the grappling and in the striking. Now, Tiago Silva, one thing, it'd be very interesting to see how this plays out. His last couple of opponents are nothing like Stanislav Nedkov. When you look at Leo, or last couple of losses, when you look at Lyoto Machida, Rashad Evans, and Alexander Gustafson, guys that use a lot of movement, are, are faster, and we use a lot of speed against Tiago, and accurate strikers. Nedkov, nothing like that. He's uh, a power striker, he stands relatively, he's fairly stagnant with his movement in the cage, and he throws big bombs, and Tiago can have a speed advantage, which will be significant. Now, uh, when Stanislav fought uh, Luis Cain, he actually was losing that opening round. Uh, Cain was able to use his speed and accurate striking, he was just throwing and picking apart Nedkov, had him back against the cage, hurt, hurt him a couple of times, and basically all Nedkov's answers were, was literally duck his head down and lead with his head and just throw wild, crazy hooks. And Kane was having success countering them and landing shots until, unfortunately for Louise, uh, one of those big, wild shots from Nedkov caught him, hurt him, backed him up, and Stanislav all of a sudden got a second win, swarmed him, and stopped him. But that's something Stanislav Nedkov, that almost sounds like a puncher's chance as far as I'm concerned, in that he throws big bombs, hoping one connected. In that instance, it did connect. Against Paul uh, or Thiago Silva, Silva has been stopped once. It was by Lieto Machida, but Machida, as I said, a much more accurate and dangerous striker as far as technique is concerned against than Stanislav Nedkov. Uh, Thiago Silva, big power, throws some decent combinations, uses movement fairly well, not on the level of Rashad Evans, but certainly will incorporate some movement, has some nice knee strikes, and he'll throw some kicks. And that's thing, another thing Nedkoff doesn't do. I think Silva has a far more diverse striking repertoire to call upon when he's looking to, you know, to open up and, and attack. One thing, too, to watch, Silva will throw with an uppercut, and when Nedkoff ducks his head, if Silva can meet him with an uppercut, that could be lights over Stanislav, so it's something to keep in mind. Another thing I, you know, I want to look at here is Silva's grappling. If he's able to use a similar game plan with Brandon Vera and take Nedkov down early, Stanislav's a very heavily muscled individual. And if Silva can get him on his back and force him to grapple, that's going to put blood into those muscles and really tire Nedkov out. And as a result, it'll make it very hard for Stanislav to throw with his power. And seeing as he does throw everything with strength and not technique, he becomes far less, less and less dangerous. Either way, I think Thiago Silva simply has more tools in this fight and, you know, he got that loss against Alexander Gustin after being off for a little bit. He should be back into the swing of things. I'm really looking forward to this fight. Nedkov has some, uh, you know, ring rust he's going to have to knock off. And either way, I think Thiago Silva is, is simply the more well-rounded striker, the more well-rounded fighter in general. So my prediction is Thiago Silva to defeat Stanislav Nedkov by TKO. Our main event prediction comes in the UFC's middleweight division as Rich Ace Franklin, the former middleweight champion, 29-6-0 with one no contest, battles former straight force middleweight champion, 8-2-0 Kung Lee. Rich Franklin coming off a decision victory over Vanderlei Silva. Uh, they fought in a catch weight of 190 pounds at UFC 147. Kung Lee, on the other hand, at UFC 148. A decision win his first career in the UFC over Patrick Cote. Both guys, and he prior to that, he lost via knockout or TKO against Vanderlei Silva in his promotional debut. Now, one thing to keep in mind here, these guys were actually scheduled to face uh, each other before Rich uh, dropped and went to fight uh, Fran uh, Vanderlei Silva at UFC 147. So they have both had extended training camps as far as that is concerned, preparing for one another. They did have the blips where they switched opponents and get ready, but they both were preparing for each other before those fights happened and now in preparation for this matchup. 
And one thing I want to look at with Rich Franklin first is he, you know, in preparation for Kung Lee, and uh, he's been working, Kung Lee, Sancho fighter, has that skill set, and Franklin went over to China to train with guys similar to that, so he has a lot of experience dealing with that style. And another thing to keep in mind, he's training in China, and that's a big deal, because we always talk about how Asian fighters making that east to west trip to fight in North America, it takes a lot out. Phil Brony talks about it, it takes a lot out of them. And as a result, we saw like Hatsu Hayoki, how good he looked at UFC 144, not having to make that big jump across the uh, Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean, depending on what direction they decide to go. Either way, that's something to keep in mind here because Kung Lee's been training in the U.S. and it may be over on the, the West Coast in San Jose, etc. But he's going to have to make that trip. I would expect Rich Franklin's probably going to already be in China and prepared and, and acclimatized with the jet lag. It's about a 12-hour difference time-wise. Now, taking a look at how these guys match up physically, big advantages to, to uh, the former straight, or UFC champion, Franklin's going to have a 6-inch reach advantage and a 2-inch height advantage. Now, Kung Lee will use his kicks. He has a ridiculous repertoire of kicks, and we know what he's capable with his kicks. He's got, uh, of his 8 wins, 7 have come by knockout. We saw how good he can throw those, you know, those leg kicks, and he will use those leg strikes to cut the distance down. But the big thing with Kung Lee, the guy's 40 years old, and leg strikes and attacking with all the fancy kicks, they are cardio killers. They will drain your conditioning. And Kung Lee, we saw against Vanderlei Silva, started off very well throwing all kinds of kicks and keeping the distance, but he started to slow down. That's when Vanderlei got a little more confidence up, eventually swarmed, hurt him, swarmed him, and stopped him. Same thing against Patrick Cote. He started off very well, but it was evident midway through the second round, his you know he was mouth was open, he was slowing down. Uh, Cote started having a little more success with his strikes, and that's something Kung Lee cannot afford here. I believe this is a five-round fight, almost 100% certain, and he's facing a cardio machine in Rich Franklin. And I would expect that Franklin's going to, if this fight goes a distance, Rounds four and five are going to be Rich Franklin, so he needs to pick up is one of the first three rounds. And if Kung Lee spends the opening duration of this bout attacking with uh, leg strikes, it's going to gas him out. Now, Rich Franklin, you know, he you look at his numbers: 15 wins by knockout, 10 wins by submission. He's very capable of. Uh, winning this fight anywhere. Kung Lee has very good takedown defense. He's never really had an issue where fighters been able to take him down and control him. He showed against Kung Lee, or sorry, he showed against Patrick Cote his ability to complete takedowns of his own. But more importantly, he can keep this fight vertical, which is good for him. And we know Rich Franklin has con uh, issues with getting knocked out. He's been stopped four times. Vanderlei Silva clipped him and nearly stopped him. So if Kung Lee puts a big kick on his chin, that could be enough to put him away. And Vanderlei Silva did have some success throwing head kicks at Rich Franklin. But I expect Rich... He's going to be aware of that, and Rich does a nice job pressuring. He did excellent against against Vanderlei Silva, moving in, keeping his back towards the cage, and landing combinations. And that's something you have to do against Kung Lee. Sure, Kung has good hand, uh, you know, striking, boxing, but it's, it's kicks that are the most dangerous. And if Rich is able to keep push pressuring him like Patrick Cote wanted to do but didn't do early at least, if Rich is able to continue pressuring him, keep him back against the cage, it's not going to allow Lee to set up his kicks and land. And that's something Kung Lee needs to do is land and attack early. I do like Rich Franklin's conditioning uh, edge over to, uh, to be the biggest factor, not so much Rich's issues with being knocked down. You look at the guys that are able to knock him out, very good strikers. Like Vito, you know, Kung Lee's a very good striker in his own right, but at his age I think is going to be an impact. You look at the guys that have knocked out Rich, Vitor Belfort, Anderson Silva twice, and Leo Machida early in his career. Is Kung Lee, a young Kung Lee, absolutely, he's in that realm, a 40-year-old Kung Lee, that's certainly something I don't, you know, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit concerned with, I don't expect uh, to see. Either way, I think Kung Lee, if he wins this fight, he's right in the mix as far as the middleweight is concerned. With whatever, anybody reach Rich, Rich, Franklin, Rich Franklin is certainly going to get a nod uh, and a push up in the next direction. But I just don't see it happening. Rich has too many tools. He has some decent striking. He has to watch that body kick to be countered because I know Kung Lee will be looking at that. Rich Franklin does throw some nice body kicks. But I expect him to attack. Look to take away Kung Lee's mobility. Look to tax his gas tank. Push him early, but not leave openings. Not get anything too wild. And I think eventually Rich Franklin will stop Kung Lee. So my prediction is Rich Franklin to defeat Kung Lee by TKO. So those are my predictions for the six main card fights for UFC on Fuel TV. Six Franklin versus Lee. Only four preliminary matchups, and they are all available over at Comic-Con overdrive.net so go over there and check them out also my bet packs will be available on the website so please take a look at them 10 bucks i know i've had a couple of poor ones in a row but i feel very good about these picks i think i've, I've you know broken these down these fights down as well as i possibly can so i'll tell you who i think uh, you look at my confidence list and say these are the five guys that i think have the best chance of coming away with wins in this night and i also talk about in certain fights you know i may have picked fighter a but based on value but i think fighter b has an excellent chance of picking up the win and you should put a little investment on him i will say certainly pick this guy like tyson Steele at world series of fighting he paid on some websites 
over $5, and I did pick Gregor Gracie, but I said Tyson Steele's a guy to look at for a potential upset, and he pulled the upset. I also talked with Josh Berkman doing that against Gerald Harris, again, picking Gerald Harris, but Berkman winning, I said, maybe take a little flyer on Berkman and see if you can pick up a few bucks that way. Either way, looking very much forward to this event. Again, I said, early start of this show, check, depending on where you are located, check out the... Uh, you know, what time this event starts for you. I will be up first thing in the morning to uh, make sure I catch all of this. Get your bets in early. I'd say get your bets in the night before to make sure you don't miss out. And uh, before I go, I had James Ryan from Ireland, a, fr uh, a long-time uh, customer and follower of the show. I'd like to give you a shout-out. Thank you very much for watching. You sent me an email. I thought I'd reply. Thank you very much, James, for all of your support. Uh, UFC 154 coming up next weekend. The return of George St. Pierre in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. That's going to be a hell of an event. I'm very much looking forward to it. I'll be breaking it down. Thank you very much, as always, for listening. Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions. <laughs>